Did the first Americans enter the New World because they were chasing whales and seals? Much of the debate about when the first Americans arrived revolves around the dating of artifacts found at prehistoric campsites. These artifacts include stone tools, stone spear points, and the animal bones they were used on. Instead, let's look at it from a different angle, from what was happening in prehistoric geology and climate. And let's speculate about what the first Americans could have done under these conditions. Tens of thousands of years ago, sea levels were lower, thanks to much of the world's water locked up in ice sheets that covered most of North America. This lower sea level opened up a land bridge from Siberia to Alaska, which is called the Bering Land Bridge, or Beringia. Research published in 2022 claims the land bridge appeared around 35,700 years ago. So that's about when the first Americans were able to walk from Asia to North America, probably following the herds of animals they hunted, such as caribou and woolly mammoths. But at the eastern end of the bridge, they would have found an unpassable wall of ice, as described in an unreferenced statement in Wikipedia. The last advance of the Laurentide Ice Sheet covered most of northern North America between about 95,000 and 20,000 years before the present day. The 2018 book, Atlas of a Lost World, describes what the first Americans would have seen. An ice mass once covered half of North America. At its greatest extent, the solid glacier, miles deep in places, stretched from the Atlantic to the Pacific to the Arctic Ocean, with no way around it. Anyone coming across the land bridge would have found the way ahead blocked. But the ice sheets did not remain impassable forever. According to the 2016 book, Strangers in a New Land, during warmer parts of the Ice Age, when ice sheets separated, a corridor opened between them and allowed the woolly mammoth to pass through the cool grasslands into Montana and the Dakotas, opening onto the rest of the Americas. The green and red arrows show how the shrinking glaciers allowed foot traffic between and around them. The ice-free corridor between the ice sheets was open and traversable by humans around 14,000 to 13,000 years before present. The timing of when these paths was open is actually very significant. Let's use a chart to compare when glaciers covered half of North America and all of Canada. When the Bering Land Bridge was available. And when the North American Corridor between glaciers was available. And for this comparison, we'll ignore the small discrepancy between the lifespans of the glaciers and the corridor between them. This block of time represents about 22,000 total years. When the land bridge was available, but the North American Corridor between glaciers was not. Meaning people could not walk into Canada. This block represents when the land bridge and the corridor were both available. Meaning people could walk from Siberia all the way into North America. This time period lasted up to about 3,000 years. So what did people do for 22,000 years? When they could not walk past the glaciers covering half of North America. Somehow, people made it over, through, or around this ice sheet long before it retreated. And before an inland passage opened between the massive Laurentide ice sheet with its neighbor, the Cordilleran. However it happened, whoever they were, people found a way in during the cold heart of the Ice Age. The 2007 book, Who Was First, Discovering the Americas, asks the question, if the earliest Americans didn't travel down an ice-free corridor, then how did they get here? Many researchers now believe that prehistoric migrants from Asia may have followed a sea route along the Pacific coast. 
Perhaps in skin-covered boats, similar to those used today by the Inuit, native peoples of the Arctic. What would have driven them to attempt it is another question. To find answers, let's look to the people who have lived in the area for thousands of years. According to the 1991 book Indians of the Arctic and Subarctic, the cultures of the natives were based on a subsistence way of life, meaning that they lived off the land. Their day-to-day -day survival depended on their success as hunters and fishers, and, to a lesser degree, gatherers. Most Indian groups, and the Inuit of the interior, organized their lives around the migrations of the caribou. The Inuit, living on the Arctic coasts, divided their time between hunting sea mammals and caribou. Seal hunting season began when the sea ice could support a hunter's weight. The Aleut and many Inuit groups also hunted seals and other mammals at sea, a more productive but equally dangerous way of hunting. Hunters rode in kayaks, or another type of skin boat called a yumiak. The larger yumiak was necessary for hunting large animals, such as walruses, sea lions, and whales. The 1994 book People of the Ice and Snow devotes over a dozen pages to how the native Alaskans hunted bowhead and beluga whales from their yumiaks. Inuit peoples living in the Mackenzie Delta region of northern Canada hunted beluga whales in large flotillas of kayaks. Traveling in large herds, beluga whales frequent polar waters during the summer to feed on salmon and other fish at the mouths of rivers and streams emptying into the Beaufort Sea. With as many as 200 kayaks on the water, the Inuit formed a line with their boats on the seaside of the whales and beating their paddles upon the water to control them, herded the terrified creatures toward the shoals, where they were harpooned. If we look at maps of the modern territory range of beluga whales, you'll see territories north and south of what would have been the unswimmable land bridge. Could prehistoric herds of these whales have lived their whole lives south of Beringia? including the south coast of Alaska and northwestern Canada? Combine that with the ranges of northern fur seals, who migrate north to breeding grounds in the spring, and south to warmer waters in the fall. Plus the range of harbor seals, northern elephant seals, and stellar sea lions. And this would have given the first Americans plenty of incentive to follow these animals south around the ice sheets. Hunting for seals, walruses, and other sea mammals, steering clear of glaciers and icebergs, early immigrants could have paddled along the southern edge of the Bering Land Bridge, then voyaged down the coast of Alaska, gradually advancing farther and farther south as each new generation staked out fresh hunting grounds a few miles beyond the last. If you look at a modern map of southern Alaska and southwestern Canada, you'll see islands all the way down to Seattle, Washington. Would these have been covered by the glaciers that once covered all of Canada? Or instead, could some of these islands have been exposed because of lower sea levels, and used as camps by island-hopping hunters in their kayaks and yumiaks. Stone tools and the remains of human skeletons dating back 13,000 years have been found on islands off Alaska, California, and Mexico, suggesting that people may have been traveling the coastal route by boat at least that early. Given all this information, it looks like prehistoric hunters from the Bering Land Bridge had plenty of capability and motivation to hunt whales along the coast of Alaska and hunt seals down the western coast of North America, where they passed the southwestern corner of the ice sheets and could begin the long walk into the interior of North America. This gave them a 22,000 year head start before the next and probably much larger migration of animals and people walking down between the ice sheets. What do you think? Could Ice Age hunters in boats have survived the journey past the ice sheets into North America? 
let us know in the comments. Thank you for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to this channel for new videos every week or two, and see the description below for a list of books and online resources featured in this video.